So I want to boil down, because I'm supposed to be talking about uh, you know, life as a message, I want to boil down what I learned here at Guelph over the many years I was here at Guelph. Uh, try to boil it down to three things that I still carry with me today. And the first is that uh, changing things for the better is a lot easier than people think, and it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, in the late 1980s, one of the hottest issues on campus was the uh, threatened logging of uh, old growth forests in uh, Tomogamy, Ontario. And uh, um, <laughs> I'd, love to, I'd love to say I planned that as a, as a complete non sequitur. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, uh, okay, flashback 1980s, Tomogamy, Ontario longer hair. Um, there was an old growth forest in Tomogamy, Ontario. Some of you may have heard of it. A lot of Guelph students got involved. We had buses going to this place. A lot of us got arrested. A lot of zoology students got arrested. Uh, it was tough slogging. We fought this thing out for years and years and years. And then uh, one day we won. It's incredible. One day we just won. And that, uh, that, that uh, forest is still standing today. And students here. Um, <laughs> Students here had a lot to do with that. I had a very similar feeling of surprise and elation, getting to the graphic behind me, which is clearly not a forest. Um, I had a very similar feeling of uh, uh, surprise and, and, and elation when in, in 2005, uh, uh, Environmental Defense, where I work now, we won this, uh, the victory for this fantastic green belt that now uh, surrounds Toronto, the largest green belt in the world, uh, 1.8 million acres of quite amazing farmland and forests, and some of the most valuable real estate in southern Ontario. The development industry not too happy, but uh, good news for anybody that lives in this region. So making change can be uh, easier than, than, uh, than it would appear. Okay, here we go. Uh, the second thing that I learned here uh, is that building community is often the key to progress. Um, at one point when my sweetie at the time, who's now uh, my, my wife, uh, who I met on the second floor of the University Center. Um, the most important thing I can point out this evening. Um, uh, at that time, uh, uh, Jen was working for the CSA, and there was this crazy, dumbass scheme to double the, the, the size of Gordon Street right through campus and to create this god awful, concrete, treeless, nasty trench uh, down the Gordon Street hill into downtown. Uh, so, you know, we got students organized at the time, which was, you know, predictable. But then, uh, but then we worked together with all of the folks who, who own houses up and down Gordon Street Hill. I remember having a few parades up and down the hill. Um, and uh, we, uh, we stopped this, uh, this change to, to Gordon Street, and it still looks very similar today. Uh, in, my, in, my current, in my current work, we built up a similar kick-ass uh, uh, impossible to stop coalition around uh, bisphenol A and baby bottles. Uh, has anyone heard of this chemical, bisphenol A? Very good, thank you. Um, so a nasty chemical linked to breast cancer and prostate cancer. Until very recently, every, every baby bottle you could buy in the stores was made with this, with this chemical. Uh, and uh, in 2008, Canada became the first country in the world to ban BPA in baby bottles. Stephen Harper's government banned BPA in baby bottles. Um, and that, that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the community that arose around that issue. Mostly young parents, mostly young moms. A lot of it happened online in, uh, in uh, mommy blog. Uh, uh, on mommy blogs or uh, other, other social media. Uh, and the, uh, Stephen Harper's environment minister actually told me that the moment he knew he had to do something about this issue was when he was buying some uh, vegetables in his local grocery store and he was set upon by a couple of irate moms who wouldn't let him go, <laughs> wouldn't let him get to the checkout counter until he promised them he would do something about this chemical in baby bottles. So the building of community around that issue around any issue is often the key to moving it forward. And the third thing I learned here um, is that, uh, that the most potent kind of idealism 
often connects to people, and now all the people who are worried about physics and numbers are getting, getting a little bit worried about this graph. I'll explain in a second. Don't, <laughs> it's an easy to comprehend graph, uh, but I'll explain in a second. Uh, the most potent kind of idealism connects to people on a gut level. And we saw that here when we unionized uh, teaching assistants and sessional lecturers. We had a couple of unsuccessful attempts to unionize uh, uh, teaching assistants. And then one day it was successful. And the reason was because we'd absorbed a 60% tuition fee increase in a couple of years and our wages were being cut at the same time. And so at that moment, in that moment, uh, it, was a, it was a very personal choice that people made about uh, protecting their livelihood. Um, the union was really a, a solution to a problem. And our book, uh, Slow Death by Rubber Duck, is also an attempt at a solution. This is a, a graph uh, from our book. And I'll just explain it. I'll take a second to explain it. What we did in the book, and what we've been trying to do at our organization for the last few years, is, is really try to change the pollution debate, to try to change the uh, image that people have of pollution, the way that people conceptualize the problem. Uh, because most times when you talk about pollution, people have this idea that it's kind of floating around out there in the air. It's kind of outside of the home. It's kind of something out there, right? So we had this idea a couple of years ago of testing people for measurable levels of pollutants. So we've spent the last few years testing the blood and urine of Canadians for measurable levels of pollution. And the long, long story short, we're all polluted with measurable levels of these toxic chemicals that reside in our bodies all the time. And so for the book, what, what we did is we tried to take it to another level. We tried to, ex we experimented on ourselves. So my, my co-author and I uh, divvied up uh, a variety of toxic chemicals. He sort of took half, I took half, because um, we thought, you know, no one of us should be, should get all the toxic fun, right? <laughs> uh, so we hold ourselves up for a couple, this is like my, you know, my zoological, my scientific training coming out with this ridiculous Michael Moore experiment. Uh, and we, we constructed a series of experiments that mimic the everyday lives of Canadians, so nothing outrageous. And then we tested our levels of these toxic chemicals before and after doing certain things. So what you see behind me is my experiment for triclosan, which is a known thyroid disrupting chemical, very common in antibacterial products these days. Uh, does anybody here use Colgate Total Toothpaste? Okay, put up your hand, people who use Colgate Total. Okay, Colgate Total Toothpaste, all right, a little bit timid. Um, okay, yes, I see you, yes. Nice teeth, my friend. Um, the, uh, uh, so Colgate Total Toothpaste users, my friend with the Guelph jersey on, I'm talking to you, yep. Um, look at the guy who didn't raise his hand to your left. This, this guy right here, with the red hair, yeah. Uh, I guarantee you, I regret to say, that your level of triclosan is at least 100% higher than that guy because of the toothpaste you use. So if you take nothing else from this lecture tonight or from what I'm saying, go home and change up your toothpaste. <laughs> that would be what I say. Because if you look behind me, after two days of using a variety of products containing triclosan, including toothpaste, my levels of this chemical increased by 2,900 times. And this is a chemical that the Canadian Medical Association uh, has asked the government to ban for household use. It's increasingly common in the home. So the, the upshot of our book is that pollution is a very personal concern. It's in our homes, uh, that we're exposed to these chemicals on a daily basis, but that there's hope. That by being more careful consumers, by choosing the stuff that we buy more carefully, you can actually dramatically improve uh, levels of these pollutants in your body sometimes very quickly. So in terms of uh, making your life your message, uh, there's no better place, uh, I'm a bit biased here because I've graduated from this place twice. <laughs> Not satisfied with graduating once, I came back to graduate twice. Um, but I don't think there's any better place uh, from which you can be graduating. Uh, whatever, whatever magical elixir has been brewed here through a combination of college royal cows and, uh, and uh, you know, hippies uh, from McKinnon <laughs> and, uh, and that bizarre prison-like maze of South residents. Uh, whatever has been brewed here is, uh, is very special. 
this place uh, has a grounding influence on its graduates. It instills in people an earthy outlook on life uh, that I think is actually sufficiently, or that clearly is sufficiently novel that, uh, that Marty Williams once uh, seriously contemplated running in the federal election under the banner of the Bloc Guelph Gua party. <laughs> That's a true story. He was gonna run for the Bloc Guelph Gua one year. His slogan being, because Guelph has a distinct society <laughs> that needs protecting. <laughs> True. Uh, he's gonna be signing people up for his political party afterwards. Uh, here, here's one difference now versus 1987. Our, our planet feels an awful lot smaller than it did when I started here in 1987. Uh, revolutions in, in Egypt are now conveyed to the world in real time via Twitter. Sil satellite imagery tells us that there's more plastic particles floating in the North Pacific than there are actual live animals. And uh, nuclear accidents in Japan are broadcast via YouTube in real time. So I spoke about community a few minutes ago. The globe is now clearly our community and it needs our help. And I, I want to underline here you know, not necessarily in a really dramatic and overt way. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone needs to go out and pick it and chain themselves to a tree and become an environmental malcontent. Though if you'd like to do that, <laughs> uh, we need all the help we can get. Uh, but, uh, but, but certainly the planet needs us and our country needs us to make our lives our message through ensuring that all the hundreds of decisions we make every day all, the, all, the, all those uh, calculations you make during your life every day, uh, that we make those decisions in a thoughtful way and that we conduct ourselves in such a way that we're considerate to, uh, to the other, to, to each other and to the other entities on this planet. Uh, there's a scene in the movie, uh, Rebel Without a Cause, where, uh, where James Dean's character is uh, talking to uh, his dad, who also turns out to be the guy who played uh, Thurston Howell III on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> but you're the graduating class of 2011, so you don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> but, you know, whatever, this guy here in the front row, yeah. I, know. I believe he might be an administrator. He, he <coughs> nodded. Uh, Maureen's giving me the thumbs up. Thumbs up. Uh, there's this interchange with James, Dean and, uh, James Dean's character and his father, and uh, the father says, uh, you can't be idealistic all your life. Nobody thanks you for it. And James Dean says, uh, except for yourself. So whether it's in terms of your relations with your family and friends or your fellow humans and the planet more broadly defined, the key is to live a principled life building on, on, what, uh, on what this place has given you. And uh, I promise you that your reward for doing so will be more significant than you ever thought possible. Thank you very much.